Today on Straight Talk Africa, the World Bank Group Youth Summit 2015, crowdsourcing solutions for climate change, and efforts to combat the effects of climate change by young and upcoming African leaders. That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America studios here in Washington. It's Wednesday, November 18th. I am Shaka Sali. And I'm Mariama Diallo, your social media reporter. Happy Wednesday to everyone. And hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. Thanks for joining us today. Today, we'll talk about this year's World Bank Youth Summit and introduce you to young people who are inspiring communities on the African continent to take action against climate change ahead of the UN Climate Summit expected to be held in Paris. And coming up later in our STA inbox, uh, we'll share your thoughts on today's topic through your emails, tweets, and Facebook comments. That's ahead on Straight Talk Africa. Hope you'll stay with us. Thanks, Mariama. But first, officials from around the world are actively preparing for the two-week United Nations Climate Change Conference in the French capital, Paris, later this month. My colleague, Zlatka Hock, has more on the story. French environmentalists demonstrated against the construction of a new airport in Western France outside the venue where the government hosted a pre-climate conference meeting. Some protesters said France should follow the example of U.S. President Barack Obama, who ruled out the Keystone Pipeline project last week, citing environmental concerns. We are here to ask France and President Hollande to do the same with the Notre Dame de Land project. French leaders hosted a three-day meeting with officials from about 60 countries to find possible compromises for a climate deal. One of the toughest issues has been financing developing countries to help them develop sustainable energy sources. Africa is endowed with uh, uh, huge renewable energy sources and potential. We need to harness this potential as quickly as possible. With the coming 10 years, Africa has to universally electrify all its uh, rural areas. And that makes to create decent jobs to, uh, to Africans. Uh, and that also helps to curb migration to Europe and elsewhere. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry addressed the link between global climate change and security in a speech Tuesday. For example, in Nigeria, climate change didn't lead to the rise of the terrorist group Boko Haram, but the severe drought that that country suffered and the government's inability to cope with it helped create the political and economic volatility that the militants exploited to seize villages, butcher teachers, and kidnap hundreds of innocent schoolgirls. British Foreign Secretary Philip Hammond, in a speech in Washington, argued that adopting measures to reduce carbon emissions will not ruin the economy. The costs of doing nothing are potentially catastrophic, beyond anything that can easily be quantified in economic terms. Opponents of President Obama's plan to reduce power plant carbon emissions say the measures would kill coal mining jobs and increase energy costs. Zlatica Hoke, VOA News, Washington. Thanks, Zlatica, for that interesting report. Uh, now joining us here in our Washington studios are three distinguished guests. Peace Liz Sasha Musonge, founder of Uganda Atemia and the Fish Farms a startup social enterprise located in the Kasese district in southwestern Uganda. She's also a 2015 Mandela Washington Fellow. Derek Jose Opio, founder and chief executive officer of the One Lamp based in the eastern Ugandan town of Jinja. He's also the founder of the Goodbye Kerosene Foundation. And last but not least, Benoit Boske, is the practice manager for environment and natural resources in charge of Western Central Africa and the Indian Ocean at the World Bank here in the nation's capital. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have to say that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you for the first time on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you, Shaka. It's a great pleasure to be here. Yeah. 
most welcome. Uh, and it's, of course, uh, equally a great pleasure uh, <laughs> to meet you for the first time, Opio. Thank you, Shaka. It's a pleasure to be here at Voice of Africa. And, you know, uh, I wish, of course, it was, but unfortunately, it happens to be Voice of America. And Voice of America. Africa <laughs> service. Now, Benoit, it is yes, equally a great pleasure, of course, uh, to have you on this program. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. You're most welcome. Are you looking forward to going to Paris, given what, of course, uh, uh, we've been uh, looking at uh, what happened in the French capital? Yes. I think, as the French government has said, it's very important for this conference to go forward, to go through. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so certainly the World Bank will be there as long as the you know, French government uh, doesn't issue any other instructions. I see. Later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-619-3111. This country code is one. Let me come to you immediately. Peace, uh, it, it's been quite some time. I know you've been uh, looking forward to being on the show. And you finally made it. Congratulations. Thank you, Shaka. <laughs> You're most welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, are you looking forward to go to Paris, to the, uh, the big, you know, summit? Um, yes, I'm excited, and I believe that this is the most important conference of parties talk that is going to take place, and there are going to be some binding issues that are going to be sorted out this time in Paris. What about the fact that uh, you live, for example, in Belgium, yes. and it looks like, in fact, some of the guys, that, uh, some of the bad guys mm -hmm. uh, that caused this problem in Paris may have, in fact, originated from some neighborhood in Paris, um, no, in Brussels. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's quite alarming, uh, the situation that is taking place with the uh, open borders. Mm -hmm. um, the level of trust has really reduced, and it's a pity that we have young people, instead of focusing on developing the world and changing for the good, they've decided to gang up and instead destroy the world, and indirectly they've affected climate change because some of the climate m matches that were supposed to take place in Paris have been cancelled. So it's, uh, it's a pity uh, living in Belgium and um, having uh, youth from Belgium trying to destroy mm. the climate talks. But I believe uh, peace will rule and it will go on. What about you, Derek? Uh, you also supposed to be attending the, the big summit? Yes. Um, very interesting. I'm actually very excited and uh, I'm looking forward to being in Paris during the COP21. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going to be an opportunity for Africa uh, because uh, like Kofi Annan said uh, some, some time back that uh, climate change affects all of us but Africa is affected most yet we contribute less to climate change. So I'm looking forward to attending COP21 and uh, I hope uh, our governments, especially the African governments, go ahead and contribute uh, tangibly and get out of uh, the summit with, a, with, the, with solutions that are going to be implemented in the next, uh, in the next couple of years. Mm. Yeah. Now, uh, Benoit, uh, do you sincerely think that uh, uh, people around the globe are going to have the confidence to go and attend this uh, very big summit in Paris, really? I hope they will. Um, as a piece said, the, this is a very, very important conference and we all need to show solidarity not just with the French people but show you know, concern about the future of our planet and this is where this is going to be decided. So it's a very, very important conference. I'm sure that the French authorities you know, will do you know, their utmost to secure especially the perimeter of the conference. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are lots of events that are planned in, in Paris, in and around Paris during the conference. We'll see uh, if all of them are allowed to go, of course, forward. What, spe what specific role uh, is the World Bank to be, uh, is going to be playing uh, in Paris? Well, you know, the World Bank is, is a leading development institution. Uh, we are a bank, we are a financier, but we also very much look to the way that the money is spent. And in this particular instance, uh, you know, we're very concerned about how climate change and poverty interact. Mm -hmm. And uh, we think that these are the two defining issues of our time. Uh, there cannot be, you know, serious poverty reduction without serious action to curb uh, emissions and to adapt to climate change, and vice versa. 
it's going to be very, very difficult for serious climate action to be, uh, you know, uh, seen on the ground if people remain so poor. So you have a very, very strong interlinkage between poverty and uh, climate adaptation in particular. Talking about poverty, uh, Benoit, there are some people who might say, wait a minute, uh, you, as the World Bank, you've been talking about uh, eliminating poverty, mm -hmm. alleviating poverty, curbing poverty. Some people think, in fact, you've been talking the talk without necessarily walking the talk so that the poor can, in fact, walk the walk. How do you react to that? Well, I mean, you know, people are entitled to their opinions, but I think we do have a track record uh, of, uh, you know, poverty reduction. Uh, you have to see what would have happened without the interventions of institutions uh, uh, like, like the World Bank. And we do have, uh, you know, success stories. Uh, and now the fact that we incorporate the climate dimension into our energy uh, policy into our energy uh, policy dialogue with countries, but not just energy, agriculture, all the aspects that are in fact impacted by climate change is very, very, uh, very positive uh, in my view. It's going to require a little bit of, of uh, you know, uh, 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 tweaking the way that development finance is mm. done, you know. Yes, you need to do agriculture, yes, you need to do energy and transport, but you need to do it in a way that is climate smart in the future. Climate smart indeed. You talk about success stories. Can you give us some examples of uh, those success stories, especially in Africa? Of poverty reduction. That is correct. I yeah. mean, you see, uh, you know, in Ghana, uh, you know, an economy that is foster, you know, that is uh, prospering. You see uh, uh, the highlands of Ethiopia being uh, greened. Uh, you know, remember, it's not such a long time ago that the uh, Live Aid uh, concert took place, and you now see in the same places, uh, you know, verdant hills with people actually able to feed themselves again. That was 1984. That's right. I was a graduate student at UCLA then, actually. Very interesting. Let me come to you, uh, uh, Peace Sasha. <laughs> now, Peace, uh, you attended the two-day important uh, World Bank Youth Summit here in Washington, D.C., uh, Monday and Tuesday. Yes. Your impressions of it? Um, my impressions of it were it was a very successful um, meeting. Um, I got to learn a lot in a short space of time. Uh, I learned uh, new concepts uh, which I believe I'll share with my African counterparts mm -hmm. about green bonds and uh, climate finance which I think Af African countries need to be exposed to and benefit from this climate change and not look at the negativity of climate change but see how you can also positively benefit from the climate change issues and not only look at it as a we are a continent that is going to be affected and it's all gloom and doom and um, then also I, I, I also met a lot of young leaders from different countries around the world mm -hmm. and as future leaders in the field of climate change we shared and interacted and uh, exchanged ideas and contacts and I was quite impressed that there were people from Denmark, people from Canada, Montreal who had projects uh, in Uganda and, um, and they were really quite excited to also meet uh, Ugandans at, uh, at the climate summit and say that it's, it's, it's kind of like impressive that there are so Africans who are really passionate about climate change and not only looking at the West to offer us solutions for climate change but we Africans, young Africans, we can work together and fight climate change. So it was a very interesting and um, productive meeting. So if I had you uh, correctly, mm -hmm. then uh, it means it must have met your expectations, correct? Yes, it did meet my expectations, yeah. I wish it had lasted a week or so. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Uh, we have to go for a break. And uh, of course, uh, now we'll pause for a short break and we'd like to uh, Remind you that uh, Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website Twitter, and we are tweeting live. Follow us at VOA Shaka. That's VOA Shaka, and join in today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA Combat Climate Change or Combat Climate Change. And we are still on Facebook. Just enter the keywords Straight Talk Africa. Become a fan and connect with other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back with you, so please, don't go away. 
Let's take a look at what is at stake when we talk about climate change in Africa. By 2050, average temperatures in Africa are predicted to increase by 1.5 to 3 degrees Celsius. By 2080, the proportion of arid and semi-arid lands in Africa is likely to increase by 5 to 8 percent. Between 25 and 40 percent of mammals in national parks in sub-Saharan Africa are likely to become endangered. Annual rainfall will decrease in much of Mediterranean Africa and the Northern Sahara. Rainfall in Southern Africa will also decrease, but an increase is expected in East Africa. In West Africa, rainfall declines of 4% is likely. By 2080, an increase of 5 to 8% of arid and semi-arid land in Africa is projected under a range of climate scenarios. Since the 1970s, droughts are more common, especially in the tropics and subtropics. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111, U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question, keep your comment brief, and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidu, you what? And of course, this is Straight Talk Africa, coming to you live from Washington. Let me come to you, Derek. Uh, I guess that uh, you also attended the uh, World Bank Youth Summit. Yes. Sir. Your impressions, any different from uh, your sister piece here? <laughs> uh, my biggest takeaway from the World Bank uh, Youth Summit was actually uh, uh, one, that there is an important uh, role that the people at the bottom of the pyramid or the youth, the rural households have to play in eliminating climate change. Uh, climate change should not be looked at as, you know, a thing to be, uh, something that has to be addressed by corporate organizations or that has to be addressed by governments, but it is something that ca should be addressed starting with the people at the, at the, at the lowest level, mm -hmm. the communities. Mm -hmm. So uh, th from the Youth Summit, uh, the biggest takeaway was we need to go ahead and find creative ways of of creating a revolution around this, starting mm. with the youth and then starting with the rural households, starting with the women uh, who are going to be most affected. Now, what about your expectations? When you came in, uh, what exactly did you expect the summit to be like and uh, to what extent uh, did it in fact uh, meet your threshold? Uh, on the first day of the youth summit, uh, one of the things that we were looking forward to as the youth was to have commitments from the World Bank that uh, after the youth summit, certain things are going to be taken away and done mm. in the next couple of maybe three, five years. We didn't expect a summit you know, to be held for only two days, and then after two days, people go back to their different countries without, uh, without decisions or without commitments mm. to, uh, with regards to how the World Bank and all these other international organizations are going to involve the youth in the struggle mm. to overcome the climate change uh, impacts. So that was uh, my disappointment a little bit. So if you go back to Ginger and yes. someone says, you know, you have been attending these, you know, very important, you know, summits. You were in Washington and you are pretty soon you will be in Paris. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, how will you justify uh, yes. the international taxpayers' money yes. that sponsors you to attend some of these summits? Mm -hmm. Because frankly, there are a lot of people on the ground in Africa sometimes who don't seem to think uh, there is some value in attending some of these important meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said earlier on, uh, for, an organ for a, a social enterprise like One Lamp that I'm running in Ginger, which mm -hmm. you're talking about, uh, we are looking, we are addressing clean, uh, we are addressing climate change through involving the local community. People like night fishermen who are busy using 
kerosene lamps to do fishing mm. across Lake Victoria. Mm. About 30,000 night fishermen are using kerosene mm. lamps to do fishing mm. on Lake Victoria. We are evolving these people in actually realizing <laughs> or shifting to modern clean energy solutions. When it goes back to the communities we are talking about, uh, how do we involve them? We are talking to women organizations who are based in Jinja. Mm and teaching them about the dangers of climate change, about the dangers of actually using things like uh, kerosene, using things like polythene bags for shopping. So when I go back to Ginger uh, uh, after the COP21, the biggest takeaway I'm going to go with is how do we increase the impact that from last year maybe we reached 4,000 households. How do we reach 20,000 households in the next 20 in the next in the next two five years mm. how do we reach uh, 1000 of fish night fishermen how do we reach uh, uh how do we reach traders in kenya in uh, in uh, in tanzania we're using the night carous uh, we're using we're using the uh, the kerosene lamps for for trade mm -hmm. so i'm going to go ahead and also appeal to more youths because africa is the biggest uh, uh, is africa is the biggest growing population right now mm. and most of these people are the youth and in the next coming years, climate change is going to affect our generation most mm. because <laughs> we, shall be, <laughs> we shall be the adults at that point. So one of, the thing is going to, one of the things I'm going to do when I go back to Africa or when I go back to Ginger is how do I involve more youths in what One Lamp is doing and what uh, Goodbye Kerosene Foundation is doing on the ground. Very interesting. Yeah. You mentioned, of course, uh, the name of your uh, interesting foundation. Yes. Uh, Goodbye Kerosene <laughs> Foundation, or GKF. That's yes. very interesting because uh, I happen to be uh, one of those beneficiaries, actually, yes. of kerosene when I was growing up, when yes. I was a very young guy. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the, new, uh, the new kid on the block? Yes. One lamp. We're yes. talking about, of course, uh, <laughs> the solar lamp, yes. really, the solar yes. bulb. Yes. Um, According to the World Bank, I think this is now common knowledge, according to most of us, that 621 million Africans don't have access to clean energy. 621 million people don't have access to clean energy. Correct. Then the World Bank will still go ahead and tell us 400 million people have access to mobile phones. Uh -huh. So if people have access to mobile phones, then this is an opportunity for us to leverage the now, you know, the infrastructure which is created by mobile phones to reach them. So what one lamp now we go ahead and do, or what we are doing, we now enable every household which has access to a mobile phone to go ahead and order for a solar light product by SMS. They don't need internet for that. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the ordering is done by SMS, and then the payment is done by mobile money. Mobile money has also taken off really well across Africa. Mm -hmm. So payment is also done by mobile money. And then the last mile delivery, which has been the biggest challenge across Africa, of reaching the people who are actually facing the problems is now done using the existing transport infrastructure. Taxi motorcycles. Mm -hmm. If you visit Uganda right now, at least every village has an average of three taxi motorcycles. Every village? Every village. You are talking about what we used to call trading centers. Yeah. I'm actually talking about villages, not trading centers, because a village has a small grocery shop. Right. Then maybe a population of about 5,000 or... Now, now, a few that homes, that yes. would almost assume, of course, that uh, you do have roads, you know, that yes. uh, provide access. Yes. Do you? Yes, we do have feeder roads. They are not tarmac roads, but they're feeder roads, and even if they are not passable throughout the entire year, at least with the taxi motorcycle, it can be accessed. So someone who makes an order for a solar light system can be reached either through, you know, uh, a nearby grocery shop mm. or to their doorstep. But if you are talking about uh, Ginger yes. especially, or yes. that neighborhood, neighborhood really, that is supposed to be the epicenter yes. of the source of Uganda's energy. <laughs> We're talking about uh, hydroelectric power here, yes. which is supposed to be the cheapest. Yes. Correct? Yes. And yet, from everything I have seen, there is this uh, Wujagari project in Ginger, yes. which apparently cost the Ugandan taxpayer one billion dollars. For a work that has apparently, uh, whose equivalent has been actually accomplished in India for about $200 million. And the one in India actually works, gives access to a lot of people. The one in Uganda has some problems. 
So how do you reconcile especially this solar bulb yes. and this almighty hydroelectric power? Yes. There are two ways to look at it. Uh, Peace and, uh, <laughs> Benoit. and Benoit from the World Bank know that one of the sustainable goals, uh, number seven, is universal access to energy. energy, energy. Yes, universal access to clean energy. And universal access to clean energy can be looked at uh, different ways. One is off-grid solutions. Off-grid solutions, and then the other way is uh, we look at uh, building dams and constructing mm -hmm. dams. Now, as a, church, as a social enterprise, our side, we don't look at uh, constructing dams because that takes a lot of resources, takes a lot of policies, takes a lot of uh, lobbying, takes a lot of raising money. We cannot do that. And it is very, very expensive. And it is very, very expensive. And yet, it's supposed to be, at, until recently, it's supposed to be the, cheap, cheap, the cheapest mode, really, of providing energy, hydroelectric power. It's just water. <laughs> <laughs> Which water is in plenty? Precisely. Yes. Precisely. Yes. So the sad part now goes back to the African governments, that when it comes back to realizing universal access to energy, mm -hmm. uh, right now we have uh, hydroelectricity or dams have failed. One is because of the cost. One, uh, the other reasoning is because you know our people are poor to afford actually the electricity connection. What about corruption? Corruption is also the other challenge, which now goes back to the government. But now, us as the youth, we're not going to go ahead and wait for government to address some of these challenges, because our generation is now at stake. We can't go ahead and wait for the government. So that's where a social enterprise like One Lamp comes in, and it is a for-profit social enterprise, distributing clean energy solutions, and we go door by door, village by village, and selling, delivering solar-like systems. Very interesting. And what is the response so far? Uh, so far, people have welcomed clean energy solutions, especially the solar lights that we are selling or mm -hmm. we are delivering to their doorsteps. Uh, One Lamp has been in operation since 2014, uh, 20, 2014 July, mm -hmm. and uh, we have managed to reach over 4,000 homes in Jinja, in really? the eastern, yes, in the eastern part of the country. And uh, one other thing it shows. Uh, which is in relationship to all these other organizations which are doing work in, uh, in Africa, Sunny Money and the rest, that there is more demand for more advanced uh, clean energy systems. So one of the other things that for, uh, we are seeing from the field or what our customers, the off-grid households are demanding right now, are uh, more advanced solar systems, something that can run a small fridge, uh, something that can run a TV, something that can run a fan, something that can... Uh, run maybe 12 lights, 8 lights. So there is that demand which is being created because of the awareness and because of uh, the benefits that uh, these, the solar light systems are, are doing because someone doesn't have to go ahead and you know, p uh, spend another $200, and, uh, uh, $200 on kerosene. Someone doesn't have to go ahead and, uh, and risk their house being burnt at night. Mm. In a country like Uganda, 75% of the house fires mm -hmm. are caused by uh, kerosene lamps. So people are seeing the benefits of clean energy, and they are welcoming it. And uh, I am thankful to the World Bank because they have a program called the Lighting Global uh, Institution under the World Bank, which mm -hmm. is doing a lot of certification of uh, manufacturers who are, dis who, are who are pushing products to Africa. And uh, a, a social enterprise like One Lamp, we only go ahead and distribute products which are certified by the by the Lighting Global through the World Bank. What about uh, its impact on education? Yes. Uh, are kids, for example, passing exams better yes. than they used to do using the kerosene? Uh, I have very good stories to go ahead and share with you about that. And I even have videos of kids narrating to, to me and to our field people how they have been able to read for an extra two hours. And this means a lot to me because as a child, I also struggled reading using a kerosene lamp. I recall I used to steal a kerosene lamp from, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which my grandmother used to lit uh, for, for supper, and mm -hmm. that's what I used to use for reading. Mm -hmm. But right now, the homes we have reached, students are being able to read, you know, for another extra two hours, three hours, mm -hmm. and this is also reflected in, uh, in their mid-term uh, mid exams and even the final exams. So we have... Uh, actual data that you really have quantifiable yes. data. Yes, we actually have uh, data that mm -hmm. academic improvement does occur when uh, when uh, when students or off-grid households uh, do 
uh, do, do access clean energy solutions. And other organizations as well mm. have similar data. Sunny Money, which is the biggest uh, uh, distributor of uh, solar lights in Africa, also shows the same, the, the same findings. Uh, which is really good. And this is what we are actually now doing, that we are calling upon organizations like UNICEF <laughs> to guide and, you know, accept this information, to guide and uh, integrate, integrate it, it. In, in the new approaches for increasing uh, academic performance or improving education in Africa and across other developing worlds. Very interesting. Yeah. You are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment. But first, here is Maria Majaro. Take it away, Maria. Well, thanks, Shaka. Still to come, we'll reveal some of the outstanding feedback we've received from our audience through social media. But now, here is our letter of the week. Leonard Masai in Nyeri, Kenya, writes, The world needs to invest in green technology and facilitate the use of untapped renewable energy, especially in developing countries. Most of the developing countries are exposed to climate-sensitive economies, such as a reliance on agriculture. The mother planet has been continuously affected by the greed and the exploitation of its natural resources. I wanted to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're going to get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number is 202-619-3111 and the U.S. country code is 1. Call us direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to turn down the volume on your radio or television and keep your comments brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gizu Yuwat, and welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Maria Ma. Take it away again, Maria Ma. Well, thanks, Shaka. The Kyoto Protocol was negotiated in December 1997 and came into force in February 2005. The treaty tried to minimize the human impact on climate change. And several countries, including the United States, have not ratified the protocol. Those nations are demanding more effective mechanism. But so far, some say they've failed to present an environmentally effective and economically feasible alternative. Well, this leads us to our question of the week, asking, given the threats many developing countries are likely to face due to climate change, should African governments commit to a new universal agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Well, we are going to open with your Twitter responses. And just a quick reminder that we are indeed tweeting live today. Uh, just use the hashtag uh, VOA Climate Change or VOA Combat Climate Change. And if you haven't yet, uh, please do follow us uh, on Twitter at uh, VOA Shaka. Speaking of it, let's go to a tweet from Dean Kayezi, who writes, more mitigation uh, measures are needed and also uh, some more climate uh, finance. Another tweet from Rodney uh, Tuhami, a law student at uh, Makerere University in Kampala, says, I don't think it's fair since the underdeveloped world needs industries to survive. Let's now turn uh, to uh, comments from our Facebook uh, uh, readers, Facebook followers. Basically, we'll go to uh, Ruva Rashi uh, Josfat uh, Omera from Lusaka in Zambia, who writes, climate change is about enhancing economic growth. This will increase the gap between Africa and wealthy countries. African nations cannot be financially independent with this global finance, with this global climate change policies rather. Well, Shaka and guess your take on these points uh, just made uh, on social media. Well, Benoit? Yes, Shaka. Yes. No, guess. these are very good uh, questions, you know, but um, our, our listeners, uh, all of us, need to realize it's not an either or. It's not either economic growth or 
climate change mitigation. I, I think, as uh, Derek uh, very eloquently presented, uh, you know, people even on the ground are taking their own, you know, lives in their own hands and saying, you know, I want light, I want electricity, I want my kids to be able to study, mm. you know, and mm. go to school. And they adopt energy solutions that are affordable, that now become uh, available. So that's a very, very, you know, clear example of climate action, which is, by the way, both mitigation and adaptation, yes. right? This is the beauty of it. Mm. By not using kerosene, those African households actually reduce emissions at their level. It's, it's very, very uh, exemplary. Uh, and at the same time, they're going to do better because their kids are going to go to school and hopefully college. They'll get access to better education, better jobs, etc. So, so I think what we need more of is these win-wins, you know, where economic activity develops, but in a cleaner way. And so anything that the international can do to help Africa leapfrog the not so clean technologies, the dirtier technologies, that's what we need to do. There's a great yearning for all of that everywhere uh, in Africa. What about uh, the doubting Thomases that in fact you even have them here? What do you do with those, Benoit? You know, these exist. Uh, you have to also find out exactly why uh, they're Thomases, you know, where the research that they cite is coming from. You know, there's, there's a lot that is uh, done to debunk uh, the so-called uh, science. I think uh, even in this country, the, the vast majority of climate scientists, you know, believe that we have a problem. Uh, and uh, and the, uh, the, the population, in fact, when they're surveyed, you know, are more concerned than, than some politicians uh, would like to portray. Mariam, uh, do you have some more reaction, please? Well, I'm, it's interesting you talk about the doubting uh, Thomas's uh, Shaka because I asked that exact question uh, to the World Bank uh, Special Envoy uh, for Climate Change. And um, I think she said that really uh, most people actually in this country, yes, it's become a pi such a bipartisan issue, but most people uh, do believe that they do need to act uh, in order basically to protect uh, this climate. Well, we're going to move on um, uh, to another posting from Mac uh, Mundu uh, from Nairobi in Kenya, who writes, this is what happens whenever there is an El Nino, the Indian Nino, or the irregular changing of the sea surface temperatures in the Western Indian Ocean virtually ensures that there is a drought in Southern Africa and rains in Eastern Africa. Next year, it will be the reverse because East Africa will be in a drought. What we need in Africa is preparedness. Good point. Another Facebook comment comes from uh, Penelope Ntanda of Johannesburg in South Africa. She writes, because of climate change, we are water challenged in South Africa, her country. Please pray for us so it may rain. Shaka, very difficult um, changes in weather patterns affecting many around the world. Your take. Very interesting indeed. Uh, you know, it's all yours, uh, peace, yes. Sasha. Mm -hmm. Your reaction to that? Um, as, a, as a researcher in the field of water quality, I, I feel the pain of South Africa. Mm. And um, they are not the only ones who are going to suffer with uh, water stress, uh, because research has, has shown and there have been, models have been done that by 2020, a quarter of Africa's population is going to be under water stress. Mm -hmm. So that is very serious. So what needs to be done is that our governments need to take this data research and really fund most of these researchers. There are a lot of young people who have innovative solutions but have not yet been exposed. So our governments need to fund these researchers and we have a good data set and help and it will it will eventually help us adapt to this to these changes because 2010 is 2020 is just five years from now and that is quite serious so we do not want to see any of of the replay of the droughts that took place in the 80s in africa so my my solution to that is that we need to if we need to invest in these technologies we need to have like drought resistant crops we need to give financing to our to our local farmers because most of them are subsistence farmers and they deal and they work with rain-fed agriculture they cannot afford irrigation so we need to have 
access to funds, finance these farmers to have, to have irrigation practices where they can afford to have these irrigation machines and everything. And, and, and another solution is that we also need to know, we need to improve our weather forecasting. We need to invest in the centers that we have in Dakar, that we have in Cape Town, mm -hmm. and that we have in Khartoum. We need to invest in them. The African Union needs to, to start investing in science. Yes, it's good to talk about politics and everything, but science is key. We need this data. Data is quite important that when you're not prepared, there's power in data. Without data, the government cannot make decisions. So that means we need to invest in, this, in scientists, in research, and have an open data and interact with different, all different African nations need to interact. Scientists from Francophone, from Anglophone need to, need to share all this data and we have one body that can work together for Sub-Saharan Africa. What, as a matter of fact, uh, according to a lot of studies, is probably going to be much more valued than uh, the traditional black gold, yeah. oil and diamonds, whatever it is, and coltan. Well, thanks, Mariama, for bringing us this week's audience reaction. Well, thanks, Shaka. The French will say, mieux vaut prévenir que guérir, uh, basically uh, talking a lot about uh, preparedness, preparedness, basically prevention. So I totally uh, second uh, what uh, Peace uh, just said. Well, that will do it for today's social media segment. Uh, just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback. Whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us, please keep them coming. And if you are a new fan, just drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com. Or post your comment on our Facebook page. Just enter the keywords Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com. Or you can join our YouTube channel. Sign up to VOA TV to Africa and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. A reminder that the show is streaming live every Wednesday. Just go to VOA Straight Talk Africa TV program page on our website or simply watch us live on your mobile device. Just download the VOA mobile app. Now let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next week on this program, after a successful trip to the United States, Pope Francis travels to Africa. Making his first trip to the continent, the pontiff will visit Kenya, Uganda, and the Central African Republic in a pilgrimage that will bring him face to face with Islamic extremism and Christian Muslim violence. We'll discuss the significance of the Pope's travel. That's next week, right here on Straight Talk Africa. Well, I gather that uh, we have to go to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. And uh, good evening, Emmanuel from Nigeria. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Shaka, good evening. How are you doing? I guess you are doing easy, terrific as usual. I am hugely, <laughs> hugely <laughs> terrific indeed. Uh, you guessed it. Yeah, this, is your, this is your boy, Emmanuel Apololo from uh, Nigeria. Long I'm time, and I'm sure you. that uh, you are enjoying the, democ the recent democratic benefits in Nigeria. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. The government of Nigeria is gradually picking up, and uh, we are looking forward to a new election. President Mama Budwabari has started on a good footing, and I believe if he continues like this, Nigeria will go places. And Shaka I would like to have you in Nigeria one of these days, at least. Come to Nigeria to uh, present Street of Africa from Nigeria. We, the fans of this program, are equally invited you to come. And um, apart from that, Shaka, I want to actually appreciate the World Bank in uh, Africa for their rule in Africa so far and what they have been doing. Uh, but we also ask that uh, they should uh, encourage the youth in the area of agriculture so that uh, there will be more food and more job opportunities for people. Off. But so far, the young uh, rather, the World Bank has actually done well in Africa. The second letter, the, young, uh, the, the World Bank should equally uh, devise a means of uh, stopping African leaders from taking our money to foreign countries. Because if the World Bank is able to stop this and block all of these things, it will go a long way. The final letter, Shaka, I want to ask you this question. The two young men that are seated with you there, they are both from Uganda. Why can't you have somebody from uh, Ghana, you know, all those countries to join you? I think it also be a long way to that. So that is all my contribution. Thank you very much, Shaka. God bless you. Very interesting, Emmanuel. Very interesting uh, 
Uh, Derek, did you listen carefully to Emmanuel from Nigeria? I actually didn't hear what he was saying. Did you? Um, I, I think he got one of the main points he had. He I'm afraid. Had, uh, Emmanuel, are you still there? Emmanuel, well, if you are there, could you please uh, uh, rephrase or ask your question again? I'm afraid. I'm afraid Emmanuel is not there, so we hope that uh, if he listened to us, perhaps he will call again. A reminder that you are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. To participate in our discussion, please call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code is 1. We'll continue our discussion in a moment, so please don't go away. Once again, let's take a look at what is at stake when we talk about climate change in Africa. By 2050, about 600 million people in Africa are projected to be exposed to increased water stress due to climate change. Within five years in some countries, yields from rain-fed agriculture could be reduced by about 50 percent. Africa has nearly 56 million people living in low-elevation coastal zones. Towards the end of the 21st century, the projected sea level rise will affect low-lying coastal areas with large populations. Access to energy is severely constrained in sub-Saharan Africa, with an estimated 51% of urban populations and only about 8% of rural population having access to electricity. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective, things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique, and this gives me that uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue, Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237, USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com. Or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gizu Yuwat. And I guess, of course, that uh, we do have uh, a telephone caller from the Republic of Uganda. Good evening, Samuel. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Uh, good evening, uh, Shakasari. How are you? Shakasari is hugely terrific. How are you, Samuel? Uh, very nice, sir. Let me. Straight away go to peace, because time is not our best ally. Uh -huh. uh, peace, yes. what message do you give to the World Bank? Thank to you. sponsor reduction of carbon emissions as a result of a lot of global emissions in the universe. How significant is the rural population uh, in sub-Saharan African countries uh, able to contribute to global climate change? And how do we combat poverty? in sub-Saharan Africa. What is your take? Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Shaka. You're most welcome. Uh, I suppose, in fact, that could have, in fact, been an excellent question yes. for yeah. Benoit. <laughs> yeah. What about that, Benoit? Yes, well, um, you know, uh, I think the previous uh, caller, uh, in fact, talked about uh, preparedness, or we, 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 uh, there was uh, something on the social media. First of all, uh, there need to be preparedness in the system. Uh, Peace talked uh, very rightly about uh, climate information and, uh, you know, uh, African uh, centers being able to, uh, you know, use the climate information that is available from the global climate models, then uh, uh, effectively uh, digest that and produce uh, useful information for African populations, uh, African farmers, uh, people in low-lying uh, areas, etc. All those who are particularly uh, dependent on, on the climate variability. So that's, that's a big, big one. Now, you also need to do good development. You need to have social policies in place that are going to be able to help the poor, you know, um, respond to shocks or that are going to, you know, buffer the shock of, of climate change, be it 
you know, uh, a, a health uh, uh, shock. You know, people go in and out of poverty sometimes because of malaria, because, mm. you know, of another disease. Um, so if you need, if you have, you know, preparedness, if you have a social safety nets, uh, you know, you are in, in a way much, much better prepared to buffer the shock that the poorest, because they will also be the most exposed to, to climate change and climate variability, the buffer the shocks uh, on them. So good development is also very good climate change adaptation. Very interesting. Well, Peace, uh, you are not off the hook. Uh, <laughs> perhaps you could take this opportunity to not only tell us about your pro project, but also uh, the fact that, in fact, you are a Mandela Washington fellow and that perhaps uh, it is your project that helped you to become that. Uh, so, first of all, our audience would like to know what is, in fact, uh, a Mandela Washington fellow and how has it, in fact, what impact has it had on your project? Um, uh, being a Mandela Washington fellow, um, it was an initiative that was started by President Obama it was he wanted to invest in the African continent and the gift that Africa has is that over 70 percent of the African population are under 25 so his gift to you to Africa was to invest in the youth so investing in the youth um, as a Mandela Washington fellow we take the ideals of Nelson Mandela mm -hmm. his love for the continent his passion he started as a young person fighting for Freedom, for the freedoms of South Africa. So as a young, as a young African leader, um, being a Mandela Washington Fellow gives me this huge responsibility that using my youthfulness, my creativity, my passion, I can change the, I can change the African continent and tackle, tackle issues that I have the talent and gift to. That's where my project comes in. I'm a, I'm a PhD student at Ghent University, and uh, what in Belgium. In Belgium. Mm -hmm. And what I'm working on is that uh, with my team, I have a multidisciplinary team from uh, from different continents. And what we're working on is that we're trying to develop a cost-effective water quality tool mm -hmm. for Sub-Saharan Africa. Because what is happening now in Africa is that we're using technologies that we cannot afford. So water quality assessment is not being done in a rapid and a frequent manner. That, that leads to a lot of these chronic waterborne, water-related diseases. So what, I'm, what, what we're trying to do in Western Uganda is that we are collecting, we're collecting different samples and uh, we're doing different analysis to get this biotic index. Which will be which will be spread to sub-Saharan Africa? Western Uganda is huge. Where specifically? We're in Kasese. We're doing it in Kasese in the Renzori areas. Really? Yeah. So that's where my my project is. And as a Mandela Washington Fellow, this is my contribution to my continent, Uganda, using my gift of science to improve the livelihoods of rural communities who depend on point source water sources. So, if with such a, a rapid tool the different water stakeholders can easily and frequently manage these water resources and then we cut on the health burden, we cut on the cost burden of using complex and expensive analysis. We use nature to tell us the story. So that's how climate change also is really important in my work because with climate change it will affect nature and then it will affect my model. Very interesting. When you talk about, of course, how uh the Mandela Washington Federal came into being, uh, mm -hmm. you have to accept the fact that uh, President Barack Obama is a visionary. Because yeah. I remember back in 2009, uh, when uh, we were together in Ghana, where he actually gave the first uh, important speech to the continent of Africa, talking about how Africa does not need strong men, it needs strong institutions. Yeah. I think after some time he figured it out and said, you know what, I think I have to look for, the, for this type of leadership. <laughs> Among the young. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it did. Really? Yeah. Now, what about you, Delic? Uh, what inspired you, really? What motivated you to take the journey that you have embarked on? Across Africa, uh, the World Bank will agree with me, 300 million students are going to schools which don't have access to, <laughs> to electricity. Now, if you visit a country like Uganda, Nigeria, Ghana, across sub-Saharan Africa and the entire African continent, you will realize that there is a big 
Uh, there is a big difference in terms of academic performance between students who are in the urban centers who can access clean energy right. and students who are, of course, in the areas who can't access, uh, who can't access clean light to be able to revise. By the to way, be... that is these <laughs> days. But for those of my generation, yes. even schools which were in rural areas yes. were performing equally well, sometimes if not better. Yes. Um, so when it comes back now to uh, Derek and his social enterprise, my side, it started with the first-hand experience of actually the dangers of using, of, uh, of using a kerosene lamp. I nearly lost my life in a, in a mm -hmm. crash thrashed mm -hmm. uh, house right. to a kerosene fire. Uh -huh. So I have a background in law and accounting and financial management, but I had to wake up and realize that the only way we are going to go ahead and achieve change especially when it comes to access to either better education, economic empowerment, is through change of what people are using in their homes. And that took me to kerosene lamps. So right now, uh, I'm working with very many youths in the country to guide and see how many households can we reach in the next five years. Five million households in, in Uganda don't have access to clean energy or electricity. And they are, they are relying on kerosene lamps. And every day or every week, a, a fire will break out and someone's child is going to die. So my passion now comes so, back so, to that. So who is not doing his part? Because uh, you have uh, an electoral season right now in yes, Uganda. Yes, yes, Is the average Ugandan stakeholder aware of the fact that a government has a responsibility to provide some of those services? Climate change has not uh, gotten mainstream in African, uh, uh, in African countries. I think all African countries. Climate change has not, been, uh, has not yet reached the mainstream theme or a mainstream topic. Mm -hmm. Right now, people are still campaigning on other sub-themes. So it is now going to be upon us young people to actually drive the topic of climate change mainstream to shout out to our leaders who are now campaigning around <laughs> in, in, in Uganda, mm -hmm. <laughs> who are now, you know, shouting about all these different things, to tell them that, by the look here, people are dying every day. A problem, a problem like kerosene lamps, uh, the World Bank still life will agree with me, kills 600,000 Africans, 600,000 Africans annually, more than HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. So it is now upon us as the youth, as the young people, this is our time to demand the politicians who are going door to door campaigning that, by the way, this is the time to make climate change a, main, a, a mainstream topic. This is the time for us to go ahead and realize it. So I'm still going to go ahead and appeal to all young people across Africa that this is the time, if any presidential nominee comes to your doorstep asking for your vote, this is the time to ask them, what are you going to do about climate change in the next five years if we elect you? This is something I'm telling the youth in Uganda. If uh, President Museveni comes to you, if uh, Kiza Besija comes to you, if Amama Mbavazi comes to your doorstep, ask them what are they going to do with regards to climate change and the impacts that we are likely to face as the generation that uh, will take over from them. Well, point well made. On that note, uh, thanks to our distinguished guests. Peace, Lisa Sasha Musonge, founder of Uganda Atemia Fish Farms Enterprise of Kasese, Uganda and a 2015 Mandela Washington Fellow, Derek Fosea Opio, founder and chief executive officer of the lamp based in Ginger, Uganda. And last but not least, Benoit Bosek, practice manager for environment and natural resources in charge of Western Central Africa and the Indian Ocean at the World Bank. Thanks to our affiliate stations, along with our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, it's Daybreak Africa with James Bate. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not beta Africa. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive. <laughs>